Good morning. Welcome to a discussion on sociology of Max Weber. This discussion relates to our MA program in sociology, also partly to our graduate program in sociology. Max Weber is a sociologist who has widely accepted to give a theories of reasoning, theories of bureaucracy and evolution of the society through a process of rationalization of thoughts and action. While we will be talking this man who is talking about rationality, he is talking about capitalism, he is also talking about the evolution of the society, we should know by locating him in the context in which he was born, in the context he was socialized, in the context he has got the education and encounter varieties of the personal, social and political problems. As you know, Max Weber was born in 1864 in Germany. So far his family background is concerned, his mother was a very religious person, totally dedicated to the cause of the family and the children and also totally guided his life, her life in terms of varieties of religious codification of behavior, norms and values. On the other, his father was a rationalist. He was practicing law and he was having an autocratic attitude towards life. In his early childhood, he was highly attached to his mother. Simultaneously, he was also attached to his father. So many a time, many scholars pointed out that he was having the problem of fixation of his emotion either to his mother or to his father. However, it is widely accepted that he was widely observing both the behavioral trait of his mother and also the behavioral attitude of his father. He went to the University of Heidelberg in 1882 and completed his university studies, then he joined the military service. At that point of time, it was compulsory to the student to undergo the military training in certain part of his or her career. So it was reflecting one or the way his love for the nation and he accepted the military service. Then after completing his military service, he again come back and join his academic activities. There he, he does his PhD on the history of commercial societies in the Middle Ages from the University of Berlin in 1889. He pursued his postdoctoral research on agrarian history of Rome. Then he joined as a lecturer in the same University of Berlin. He joined simultaneously, was elevated as a professor in the University of Freiburg in 1883. Then he joined as a professor of economics in the University of Heidelberg in 1896. He emerged as an intellectual and central figure for varieties of the discussion. All through his interaction with the contemporaries and also with the intellectual leader at that point of time, he was raising varieties of the issues and those issues were located in terms of significance of value in one life on the other hand and also rationalization of one's thought on the other. So his interaction was with his colleague, his interaction was also with the fellow uh, student and also with the relatives. While we talk about Max Weber, we have to accept that Max Weber felt varieties of the ailment all through his life. He suddenly collapsed in 1896, there was a nervous background. Before that also he was having varieties of the physical problem. However, he continued with his study and his intellectual journey, um, ignoring varieties of those personal and physical problem. He also developed a kind of a psychic illness and gradually he withdrew from the academic world. So there was a kind of exit and entry in the academic world. He was studying, he joined the military service, he came back, Again, he located himself within the aura of intellectual environment. Then he suddenly he collapses because of his illness. Then he rec recovers and gradually again he joins 
his intellectual life. This intellectual life that started from early 1901 or two, it has become a highly fertile, highly productive age of his life and he has made significant contribution and that have made him immortal, not in the realm of sociology, but also in the realm of political science, agrarian economics, also at times public administration, also of history, he is widely considered one of the renowned and reputed and immortal intellectual. Some of his important work, as many of you may be knowing, in 1904 and 1905, he published his famous work, The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism. Then in 1904 and 1905, he talked about the methodology of social sciences. Later on, that is translated in English uh, by Talcott Person. Uh, and then we find his famous work came out in uh, 1915. That is the religion of China, um, uh, that's Confucianism and Taoism. Then we find he also published in 1916 and 17. The religion of India, the sociology of Hinduism and Buddhism that is considered one of the significant texts in the literature of sociology on India and about India. He also wrote in 1917 that ancient Judaism. Then in 1970s and 20, he, uh, he wrote general economic history. Then he wrote about uh, the city in 1921 and in in 1922, he wrote the theory of social and economic organization that is after his death, uh, it, it was published. Uh, then we find he has written varieties of essays starting from 1906 to 1924. Uh, those essays, that essays in sociology from Max Weber, essays in sociology that covers themes starting from bureaucracy, the music, the art, culture, the economy, politics, the so varieties of the themes he covered. Uh, in all of his write-up. So what we find that is if we were to describe Max Weber, um, uh, we find Max Weber was having a lot of interest in understanding the politics. He was also because it is through the politics one exercising the power and authority. It is through participation in the politics somebody exercising the rationality and participating in the democracy also influencing the economic behavior. So what we find Max Weber, we find Max Weber as a nationalist, also we find Max Weber as a democrat because as a nationalist he was German and his German nationalism was non-compromising. He was simultaneously, um, he is not a nationalist, he was also a critical nationalist. Being an intellectual, uh, he developed a lot of criticality of the nationalist leader, especially of their war policy uh, against the First World War and he became quite critic of the government. And he, but that government also accepted his view and he became an advisor of the Versailles Treaty that was, uh, that was signed uh, after the First World War, that is Versailles Conference in 1919. And he became very highly politically active in the later part of life that is starting from 1918 onward. So uh, people, many of the scholar point out that uh, the, his political activism in public life was visible in 1919. Um, however, his political participation was not a mass of, uh, of a plain one. He also faced a lot of resistance from the German leader and also he was, critic, he was quite critical of the communist and the Marxist at that point of time and he also faced a lot of resistance uh, against them. Uh, while he was participating in the political life, he was uh, making uh, enormous contribution uh, to the academic world. This life came to an end on June the 14th, 1920. But even though Max Weber died in 1920s, he has widely contributed and through this contribution, he has remained immortal uh, in social sciences in general and sociology in particular. If we were to talk about the contribution of Max Weber, uh, we, we can talk about um, the four important theme uh, he, he has widely contributed. One is the methodology of social sciences. How the methodology of social sciences, how social science can be considered uh, as a science. Um, 
and his uh, he widely talked about uh, to making the um, uh, social science a science he he prescribed that social science should follow a process of compartmentalization what he talked about the value judgment and value reference a social scientist will study value because when you are studying the rationality of a behavior you are studying somebody's ethics studying somebody's religion it is important that you are studying somebody's value but as a social scientist a social scientist should not allow his own value to influence the outcome of his research so what he prescribed the term what he called a value neutrality how the value neutrality can be achieved he widely talked about that is he used to compartmentalize from value judgment and value reference value judgment means you are attributing your sense of good and bad to certain phenomenon processes and certain action what max over talked about you are to accept as it is as a social fact when you are accepting as a social fact as a social action what you will have to do you will make it a reference because it it has been used by certain people certain um, context so your basic question should be why this value how is this this value how it is used and then why it is used and what it would be what it would be means what kind of society is going to be evolved out of one's location within this value laden society uh, here a social scientist is to compartmentalize his own value from that of the value of the subject that the value of the society so what you widely talked about value neutrality he also talked about uh, sociology study of social action what is social action when he was talking about social action he was talking about an intended behavior it is not an isolated behavior an intended behavior which is emerged out of one's own conscience that intended behavior is implemented in a context in a context which is circumscribed by values norms customs of the society directed to certain individuals and group and it is also having immediate kind of similar kind of reaction towards that action so it is a study of social action sociology he also talked about study of rationality that just realization of one's thought and action in terms of empiricism in terms of predictability in terms of calculation so what we talked about in terms of rationality and what we talked about he has implemented all those thing in the context of what what we talked about sociology of religion and sociology of economic life so what he tried to see that is he has not tried to see the economic and social life in terms of compartmentalization rather a kind of interrelationship of social behavior with that of religious behavior now there has been a talk widely at the realm, realm of social scientist in general sociologist in particular and also of the politicians and policy makers they widely talk about compartmentalization of the economic life from that of religious life compartmental uh, compartmentalization of political life from that of religious life but what dave maxover was talked about enormous influence of religious life on the economic life it is the economic life that also widely determined one's political life so uh, we'll, we'll be coming to this discussion it later but what is important at this point to accept that maxover has widely contributed to understand the location of religion the place of religion in the economic life of the individual in society uh, so if if we talk about max weber has tried to understand the society in terms of certain model that max weber's model we widely consider max weber's model is the ideal type when you talk about ideal type of max weber uh, it, it, it's the max weber have tried to identify certain typical traits typical traits um, you know uh, it, it it is not not the a general trait uh, the average trait what it is a particular trait that through that particular trait he has tried to understand the whole society that's why he has developed the ideal type of varieties of the thing that is ideal representation through a particular trait of that society so that is that is not a total representation that is a particular representation that particular representation may be used for a wider generalization that may or may not be true 
But there is certain trait that traits are to be accepted as an ideal type, a kind of a model. That's why he has talked about, when we talked about the model, uh, we will be talking about the model of bureaucracy he has talked about, model of religion. So uh, that is quite important. So when we are talking about the ideal trait, it is not general or the average trait. What is he talking about? Exhibiting a partial concept of the whole. It is not the totality, a partial concept of the whole. So we have to try to understand the society through that part, the whole society. So uh, it, it is the it is the capacity of a social scientist and his kind of engagement with the society, how we can try to know the society through the, uh, no, the totality of the society uh, from one particular uh, trait. Take into consideration if we are to understand the society, understand the society in totality. In the totality of the society, we are having religion, we are having politics, we are having culture, we are having education, we are having economy, we are having varieties of other everyday kind of activities. If that activities can be known through one trait, and Max Weber was trying to understand the whole society through one religious trait, religious behavior. It is through the religious behavior, one part of the society, he was trying to know the economic, social, political and economic totality of the society. So that's why he was talking about a kind of an ideal, uh, ideal type. So it is, it, it is not a description of the concrete reality, it is an abstraction. So it is an abstraction, through that abstraction we are trying to know the whole totality. So it is, it is not deterministic. Uh, that may or may not be, it is not deterministic, but it gives an opportunity to look into the society from particular trait to that of other. At that point of time, we'll have to accept that. When Max Weber was writing in 1901 and 2, by the time, uh, writing of Karl Marx has widely influenced the German literature and West European literature. And the economic determinism was trying to talk about it is the economic engagement, economic well-being and the economic determinism, the factors of production, the social relations of production, the intersectionality between these two widely determining the course of social development. Even one's values and norms was determinant to what kind of economic formation is there in the society. So when Ma Karl Marx talked, Max Weber starts with there. Max Weber starts with, it is the values and norms of the society, that parts of the society that determines the totality of the society, if totality is the economy, or totality is the political economy, he's talking about, it is through that part, that particular trade, the values, norms and customs, wants to understand the whole social formation, social development and social progression uh, in, in the human society. So his model, that ideal type, is not a concrete, what he's talking about, it's an abstraction. It is through the abstraction, through that part, you will have to know the total society. So what is talking about this ideal type, that abstraction um, will help uh, to, to derive certain general proposition. So let us not come from general to particular, what he is talking about, go from particular to the general if possible and it will help that ideal type, that abstraction, that part research will help for certain empirical research and ultimately it will lead to the development of certain theories. What we can talk about in terms of the grounded theory, we talk about in terms of empirical research, through that empirical research, that particularities, particularities of studying the values, norms and through that abstraction you can enter into a grounded theory in, in, in the society. Uh, now when you talk about the, uh, you know, ideal typical representation of the society. Uh, we, can, we can take uh, two, uh, three examples uh, for our analysis today. Uh, one that um, the historical particulars, uh, when you talk about, he talked about how the capitalism has evolved on this earth. Um, uh, it is the capitalism uh, that has developed with the interpenetration of marketization of the economy. 
commoditization of the economy that was engineered by the whole process of industrialization and urbanization and ultimately it leads to a development of a, a kind of capitalism what Max Weber talks about quote unquote in his term is a rational capitalism. So this rational capitalism it is also not that it has carried forward from this cumulatively historical development, rather he is talking about it is a particular historical development. If that particular historical development is to be looked into, what is talked about, it is to be looked into in terms of a particular conjunction of the society, a particular juncture of the society in which certain thoughts and action of the people got, religious thoughts and action of the people got rationalized. So what is important to know at this stage, you know, what way? what way Max Weber contributed to understand those historical particulars, those thoughts and action at certain point of time get rationalized to develop what he called to foster the growth of rational capital on this earth and how do it link to religion I am coming a little later. Before that he has also widely talked about abstract element of reality. His idealism, ideal type is not only linked to historical particular, it is also linked to abstract element of reality. Some of the abstract element, let us take into consideration, he has widely talked about bureaucracy. While we are talking about bureaucracy, he has found out a kind of abstraction. Through that abstraction, we can know a kind of functioning of the bureaucracy, the structure of bureaucracy. What is structure of bureaucracy? He had, he had tried to give certain abstraction. Through this abstraction we can know. He is talking about bureaucracy is an organization. We accept that. Bureaucracy is an organization that is widely linked to specialization of activities and division of work. Specialization of activities means there are certain specialization of activities. Those specialization of activities are to be done by certain specialists managerial special, the technocrat special, the financial specialist, the academic specialist. So what we find is a specialization of activities. Within the specialization of activities, there are also the division of work. So bureaucracy is founded on specialization of activities and also it is based on division of labor. It goes to second part. Then what he talked about when there is division of labor, and specialization of activity, what he is talking about, there is also the, uh, what he talk, a hierarchical structure of bureaucracy. There will be a hierarchical st structure in which there will be somebody at the superordinate position, somebody at the subordinate position, somebody at the middle position. So you find everywhere in the bureaucratic organization, there are the elements of what we call an amount of hierarchization of one's position within the bureaucracy. So first he talked about specialization within that division of labor, third he is talking about hierarchical structure. Then he is talking about once there is hierarchical structure that is to be linked with to be guided by certain rules, regulation and procedures. It is not somebody has given all of a sudden these rules and regulation and next day somebody is coming and changing it. No, what is going? It is to be guided by an established procedure, rules and regulation. So specialization and hierarchy is established on uh, what is talking about rules, regulation, procedure and also who is talking about impersonality. Bureaucracy is not personal. If there is a hierarchy, somebody is holding a position in the, uh, in the office and in the organization, he is impersonal. Impersonal in that way, he is personally detached from that position, he is particularly given that position to perform certain role. It is not a personal reflection, it is the reflection of that organization. So whatsoever the properties of the organization that is not the property of the person those who are occupying it because they are dissociated from it, they are there for the performing certain rules and regulation based, performing certain function based on the rules and regulations of the society. So what is talking about simultaneously once that impersonality is coming that impersonality is developed based on certain qualities, those qualities are founded on echo and formal 
education and skill in the organization. So there should be established rules and regulations of one's entry and exit in the bureaucracy. So what is important that that is uh, in the bureaucracy there will be rules and regulation for employment. Those employment will be impersonal and also there will be long term employment. Within this employment there will be a kind of a policy of exit and policy of inclusion that is entry and exit. Then we find that is when you are talking about bureaucracy there is to be everybody is to uh, you know, uh, distinguish between the personal and the official as I told an amount of reflection of impersonality. So what he is talking about these are the characteristics feature of bureaucracy if we take into consideration the six seven feature what is talking about specialization and hierarchy uh, is talking about uh, division of labor, he is talking about rules and regulation and impersonality, recruitment based on certain rules, knowledge and ability, long term employment with empl exit and entry and also dissociating personnel from that of the official. This is an abstraction, through this abstraction we have to know that how a bureaucracy function in the society, that is an abstraction. But if you look into the functioning of Indian bureaucracy, many a time those rules and regulations are not followed. Impersonalities are not made inbuilt. It is not only in India, you will find many cases in the South Asian countries, also in the Western Europe and in the American countries, many of these things, the personal and public get interlinked. Many of this time there is a kind of influence of the primordial identities, caste, class, religion within the functioning of the bureaucracy. So bureaucracy we consider it is to be, it is to be an ideal typical reflection of understanding formal organization in the society but those are localized circumscribed. So here we are here to accept the fact that bureaucracy is a reality and bureaucracy is an ideal type. Through ideal type we are trying to understand certain formal organization but those formal organization are also guided by certain localized norms, values and aspirations and those are widely cultural conditioned and that's why we will have to understand bureaucracy. So we are having one model given by Max Weber. So what Max Weber himself told that bureaucracy itself Bureaucracy itself may not be ideal typical, it may be an iron caging of the people, it is, it is, it is hindering one from uh, you know, uh, uh, innovation, one's uh, sense of innovation, one's sense of engagement, it is iron caging. But simultaneously there is a possibility that it is an organization that is to stay in the society for the functioning of the civilization, the organization and the democracy, so it is an important uh, imperative that bureaucracy be there in the society. But how the bureaucracy is to function, its limitation of functioning as an ideal type, as a sociologist will have to link with the cultural conditioning in which bureaucracy is functioning in the uh, contemporary society and in the contemporary, contemporary world. Uh, let us go to another ideal type he has talked about um, that is social action is an ideal type and he has talked about uh, social action um, uh, three types of social action we can many a time talk about the four types of uh, uh, social action it is imperative to understand the, uh, the social action to arrive at the causal explanation of the cause and an action. So what is talked about that is it covers when you talk about uh, social action we have to accept that social action covers all human interaction. It's, there is no action um, uh, is not covered rather it is, it is widely inclusive all social action all human action uh, comes under the boundary of social action number one. Number two it attaches subjective meaning to it whatsever we are doing it is having a subjective meaning to it take into consideration uh, the three salutes uh, of the military, the, the, the air force having a different kind of salute, uh, our artillery is having a different kind of salute, navy is having a different kind of salute. So it is a different kind of a symbol. Say Namaste is having a different kind of somebody folds a hand means somebody showing the respect. So it, it, every action is having a kind of uh, a different kind of a value. When the hand moves different way, different kind of meaning 
evaporates out of it. So every action is having a meaning attached to it and is a part of human behavior. Third, he is talking about uh, uh, acting individual takes into uh, account, um, rather it recognizes the presence of our others and behaviors of others. When somebody is performing certain action, it is performing in a context. So that context is that, that, that meaning what somebody is delivering, it is to be re received by other in the similar way. If somebody gives somebody a salute or gives somebody a namaste, it means other will bow down the head. So it is reciprocating. So if others are not reciprocating, it means that message is not con conveyed either or somebody is denying that message. That message, that symbol, that meaning is to be reciprocated through social action and th fourth he is talking about it is directed, um, uh, it is connected to the, uh, you know, the course, all social course because in the social context so it is guided to a social course because the, no course is isolated so one action linked to another kind of social action. So what he is talking about when you talk about social action, social action is also an ideal type, it is covered by human behavior and values, it evaporates certain meaning, it goes in a context, it's also having a kind of what is talking about a, a, a course of its own. So what is talking about, uh, Max Weber has talked about in his ideal type, four types of action. What are those four types of action he's talked about? He's talking about Jack Rational, that is rational action related to goal. That is, that, that is, um, it, it is in terms of certain um, uh, goal oriented action. That is, you want to have some action related to some goal. Um, because if, if you want to get something, the action is to be uh, directed towards, the, uh, to, towards that. So student are to writing the exam, goal is to pass the exam. Students are studying the action, that is an action, what is the goal? Goal is to acquire more and more knowledge. So we find a kind of rational action. Then we are having rational action with regard to certain, you know, certain values. So it is linked to uh, certain action when you are performing uh, certain uh, worshipping. It is also linked to some kind of values in the society. So again he is talking about certain traditional action in the society. Um, those traditional action widely linked to in terms of showing traditional respect to somebody, that is one. We are also the affective action, what you call the emotional action in the society that is not guided by reasoning, that is not guided by legality. So what Max Weber widely talked about, four types of action, those are the ideal four types of action. Keep in mind, it is an ideal type. So that ideal type of particulars, he is trying to know the totality of the human society and the behavioral pattern of the society that is transiting from one section, one area of the society to another, social to economic, economic to political, it is, and religion to economics. So we find the intersectionalities between varieties of social phenomena. but what Max Weber is trying very specifically, he is trying to understand the whole through certain parts in the society. But Max Weber, when he has talked about authorities, Max Weber also is uh, uh, ideal types of action. Max Weber also widely talked about ideal types of authority. He has talked about three types of authority. What is a traditional authority? Maybe traditional authority is the king. Traditional authority is the father. There is a rational authority. Maybe the rational authority through rationality of action. The prime minister of the country, uh, the, the, the president to meet Mahatma Gandhi because they are the charismatic leader. So it is not guided by one's traditional attachment to Mahatma Gandhi or traditional attachment to Subhash Chandra Bose or a rational attachment. It's a kind of a charismatic, a kind of emotive. So here is a kind of charismatic authority. So what he is talking about in the society, so what he has given even those three types of authority, the traditional authority, the rational authority and the charismatic authority and these are again the parts. There may be deviation, there may be authorities, one charismatic authority, maybe reflection of all the three or traditional may be reflection of all the three, rational may be reflection of all the three. But what is talking about that is it is an ideal type, it is an ideal type, reflection of the part through that part will enter into the society to know the whole. 
Now, when we talk about this rationality, I mean, uh, as you told, we will have to understand another important contribution of Max Weber, his contribution to understand rationality. So, rationality, um, widely talked about the relevance of rationality is that society itself is a process of rationalization. If we have to understand rationality, we have to understand the society. Rationality can't function uh, in isolation. If somebody is standing alone in the seashore or in an isolated island alone and saying he is a rational behavior, he is a rational being, he is trying to rationalize himself, but rationality will stand apart. What is important? Society itself is a part of rationalization. The rationalization comes through a process of evolution from tradition to rationality. What is that rationality we are talking about? A rationality in terms of calculability, in terms of predictability, in terms of observability, in terms of repetitiveness. So those kind of rationality should reflect in terms of behavioral patterns and continuities. So there is a process of transition of the society from tradition to that of a modern society, from tradition to the, that, 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 that of a rational society. So many a time, rationality has been equated to that of modernity and modern reflection. So that come, may, will come a little later. So what Max Weber accepted rationality as a methodological tool, as a tool, a methodological tool to understand the transition of the society, transition of the society as I told um, from tradition to the modern, to understand the, uh, a process of transformation within the religion. Uh, that is also through the process of rationalization, a process of development of capitalism with, through the instrument of capitalism, also the bureaucracy and social action. So it is a rationality through which he is trying to evolution, trying to know the evolution of the society from the pre-modern to modern, from the traditional to the rational, uh, from pre-capitalistic to that of pre-capitalistic. Uh, within the religion we find a kind of um, uh, traditional religion to that of a rational religion and traditional action to that of a rational action. So what we find, he also simultaneously used rationality, a kind of a tool to organize research. How, how, how this tool can be used to organize a research, he talked about that making a compartmentalization between the value reference and the value judgment. So what is important here, he is using rationality as a process of understanding the evolution of the society, he uses a methodological tool, he is trying to understand the evolution of the religion, capitalism and bureaucracy and social action and also he is using how the sociology as a discipline is evolving from that of a value-laden society to that of a, to that of a value-free society. That is the kind of rationalization he is talking about. And that he has widely used in the context of study of religion in the society. What he talked about, that is, it is the economic behavior of the society. If we were to understand the economic behavior of the society, what he is talking about, that economic behavior is not independent of the religious behavior. He has cited the example of, of Protestant ethics and spirit of capitalism. In the Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism, what he is talking about, it is the Protestant, the Puritan sect um, of the Protestant, they rationalize their thought. How they rationalize their thought, they rationalize their religious calling that they have, they have taken birth in this earth, they have taken birth in this earth as a will of the God. So what the God has given them, a chance to come to this world, they have given certain calling. What are those calling? Number one, you have taken birth in this world to beautify this world. So you are born not only to born and to consume, you are born to beautify this world. Once you want to beautify this world, you need money. So uh, if you want to need money, how you will earn money? Then you, talk, you have to work hard to earn the money. By working hard, you have to be, you have to be genuine. You have to be genuine. So you have no time to relax. You have to work, work and work. Once you are working, you are earning something, making some profit. But what you are doing that profit? That profit you are not made to consume. That profit again you invest. 
so that you can earn more and more profit. You earn more and more profit, you invest those profit again in the way in more more expansion of your business, expansion of your industry, in the way you contribute to the generation of wealth and employment in the society. And this generation of wealth and employment in the rationalization of the thought comes because it's a calling. God has sent you in this world to beautify this world. You can beautify by earning more and more wealth, generating more and more employment. And through that, you will contribute to the uh, beautification of this earth. And through that, you will, be, you will be genuine to pay the taxes. You will be genuine to your friend. You will be genuine to your family. So what it is talking about, a kind of a religious calling, a kind of a rationalization of the thought, that gave birth to that of what is talking about a rational capitalism. A capitalism, a amount of money, the wealth you have generated, not to destroy, but to employ itself, reuse yourself, reinvest uh, that money and that wealth for the further generation of wealth and employment in the society. Just opposite, he talks about in Indian society, there has not been the development of rational capital because Hindu dharma is guided by the whole spirit of spirit of salvation and accumulation of wealth has not been considered as one of the motto of life it has been considered that is take away earning wealth is a kind of a sin because once you are earning more and more wealth you will be attached to this world once you will be remain attached to this world you will not go for salvation and so, so to go for salvation if that is the life your life is guided by karma so if you acquire more and more wealth, you will be acquiring more and more sin and through that sin, you will be again rebirth in this society. So you want to break the birth, break the circle of this rebirth. If you are to break the circle of this rebirth, what is oriented out of you? That is, you will dissociate yourself from accumulation of the wealth. So here lies a difference between Protestant ethics and the Hindu religious ethic according to Max Weber. And Max Weber is talking about it is not that there was no development of capitalism in India. What he was talking about, there was development of capitalism, but those are adventurist capitalism. Adventurist means it was not guided by rationality. It was guided by chance. There is a difference between a gambler and an entrepreneur. A gambler take a risk. He may or may not win because a gambler out of temptation keep on investing money, he may lose. But an entrepreneur, entrepreneur learn from the experience. He takes the initiative. He's having the leadership capabilities. He renovates every time. But a gambler, he never does. So what is talking about a gambler is an adventurist. So whatsoever the gambling take place, it destroys the people. In Indian context, he talked about there has been the emergence of a kind of adventurist capital and adventurist capital is not a rational capital. So what he tried to do, he tried to understand the society through the rationalization of thoughts and action uh, of, of human being uh, on this earth. So at this point, what, 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 we, we try to say that, that is, he talked about um, the spirit of rationalist and the religious values, especially of the uh, Protestant he talked about, this uh, these all the asceticism. They will earn the wealth, but the remained ascetics as a saint in this world, they will not consume. They will make the world, uh, they, will, they will make words when buying and selling uh, is uh, huggling. So they will use the limited world. The trade with the communities, and paying the necessary taxes. So everywhere there is a kind of, uh, you know, kind of rationalities and simultaneously uh, they, they will avoid all kind of luxuries and, and that is a notion of calling. So it is a, it is a kind of a God's given responsibility um, on this earth. They will perform certain duties and so that they will lead to the development of capitalism. But the Hindu way of life, as you talk about, um, that, that is having a negation to capitalism. So what we have tried here, we have tried to understand, uh, tried to understand uh, 
the theory of Max Weber, you understanding, understanding capitalism, theory of uh, Max Weber, understanding the evolution of religion, uh, of theories of Max Weber, understanding uh, the development of rational organization uh, in the society. We are aware that there are varieties of criticism of Max Weber in understanding uh, Indian society that talk relevance of Max Weber in contemporary world and relevance of Max Weber in understanding contemporary society will take care of in my next lecture. Next lecture. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you.